Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you for coming. I know it's been a long conference, so we're, and we're reaching the point where everybody's kind of wilting in their seats. <laughs> like, okay, more stuff? Oh, God. But, <laughs> and especially for like an editorial thing at a designers and developers CMS conference, I'm really thankful that you are here with me. And I am thankful that you are willing to be part of what has become a little bit of an experiment. I started this off on and again, it was going to tell you all about the CMS tools and the things of Coral. And then what has happened over and over again, news happened. And so if you've been reading the news, we're not going to go too in depth right now, but you open up your news and it's just like, oh, oh God, time to change everything again. And <laughs> I wanted to do something different. And based on my assumptions, it might have been good, which is great. So this is, the title of this is Lessons Learned from Open Source Journalism. My name is Sadette Harry. I am currently editor at Mozilla. I was, project, I was community lead for the Coral Project, and I'm editor at large of the Coral Project. And I wanted to talk about journalism. But more importantly, I wanted to talk about communities. I am speaking today as Sadet. I am going to talk about some of the tools we've built with Coral and talk about the work that I'm going to go forward in doing with Mozilla. But what's really important to me personally is that I talk with you and we talk together as people. I am a person trying to work a problem. Do not hold anyone who, hold, who employs me responsible for anything I say that you don't like. If you like it, don't tell them I'm wonderful. But, <laughs> It is very important to me that we talk about communities and it's, we talk about people because Drupal is open source content management, it's communities and Mozilla is open source and Coral is built open source. And I, as with most of my life, love the idea of it but then kind of want to poke the wound because St. Thomas was my favorite saint. And think about how that relates to journalism and what we do and what we need to go forward. So I like to reference books because I'm made, made, mainly a research head. And this is considered one of the seminal books about communities, Benedict Anderson's Imagine Communities. And it believes that there are three levels, social, historical, and the imagination, where print media, and he talks about print capitalism, and it goes off and off and off, into the idea of, cong of we congregate spread identifiers into communities. So we all decide we are a thing. We decide that that thing has to get together. And we need something to codify that thing. So we make a tool, or we make print, and we center around this. And one of the things that I've always looked at looking at this book and whether or not it translates to the common age, both in journalism, in coding, in context, is it doesn't necessarily talk about how creators work in this. So creators and makers of tools and how we streamline things help develop cultures of community. We don't, they don't talk about that, but a lot of how we do the things is part of the cultural community. And I want to pull that in there. And the, I kind of just went, we, and redid this, is I really, and one of the big things I want to think about is I feel that often, Programmers, coders, people who make the things are left out of the discussion about what we need to change about journalism, what we need to change about communities, because those skills aren't as valued as they should be, and not in a monetary way, but in a very, these are the people who notice patterns. These are the people who put things together. And we don't think about how do we bring that voice into the room. And as we're and working with journalism, especially after the last two years, whew, there has been a lot of discussion about who we are and what we do and who aren't we listening to. And I think that that often goes external, but I also think it needs to come internal as well. Who does not feel empowered to speak within? And because that will also influence who does not feel empowered to speak without. So the first thing I like to talk about, because I always love to big up my project, and I, even though I am now editor at large, Deep Love is Coral Project, started in 2014, Washington Post, New York Times, Open News, which was under Mozilla at the time, we're now under Mozilla. Specifically, Sasha Corin, and Aaron Pilhoffer get together and go, comments are terrible. This is not untrue. <laughs> How do we build better comments? 
And they said that in 2014, we got an endowment from the Knight Foundation. We thank you so much. And in 2015, they hire our project lead, Andrew Lazowski, and then me. So it's the two of us. And we promptly get together with a technical advisor who becomes our tech lead, and we get a whiteboard, and we decide, we're going to put this together, and what do we need to do? And we look at it, and we go, meh, nah. We don't need to build better comments. We need to think about the communities around news. This is what happened. And it was idea because it is modular, so it was like little bits of coral, and we were going to build multiple things, and they were going to fit together. The first tool we built was not a comment system. It was Ask. And I have all of these up, and if necessary, I have the slide deck together, but it was based off of a story I read, possibly apocryphal, possibly not, about Benjamin Franklin when he was asked, how do you get someone who dislikes you to like you? Get them to do you a favor. So he asked someone for a small book, and Benjamin Franklin founded the school I went to, so that's probably part of how I received it. And he asked for someone for a small book. And rather than giving something, he made that person feel that they were useful, that they were part of that community, that they were part of his community because he had taken something from them. And when it comes to content management and developing for systems, one of the things we found was that there's so much of this development was done in spaces that was like Google Form or Type or Server Monkey or something or Doodles, where it was designed not for the journalistic workflow. It was not designed for the way journalists work. So we're trying to take people who work in a very literary put together way and then asking them to use data that doesn't work for them. As well as news is happening, people personal identifying information, people's addresses, their trauma, all of this, when they are submitting things, they're just sending it willy-nilly. From immigration rates to everything, you're soliciting information and people go, you are the one place I can send information because journalism is where we go to tell people things and we don't have a way of saying, okay, I want your story, but I don't necessarily need all of this. I don't have a way of being good at intermediaries. So what we did was, did a lot of research and we figured out a way to solicit asks, how to put together personal identifying information separate from original information, how to look at, if I edited this, how can we backtrack? How can we track those things? How can we maintain the integrity of a journalistic process while also being kind of warm and being able to control what happens and deal with debate and deal with polarization? It's been used in Philly.com by the Boston Globe and Newsday, and I use those three examples because Philly.com, it was used the day after the election and we used emojis to ask people to tell us how we feel about the election, so it had a plug-in, and it was able to be moderated. So we got to see what you said before we put it on. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Boston Globe. Boston Globe did that very big race story. That is a touchy subject. In the city of Boston, it's a very touchy subject. And parts of it didn't go the way it necessarily needed to go, but people submitted Oh, thousands of stories. And we were able to anonymize them, talk to them, get back to them, and keep that in a way that the story presentation, the ability for people to confide in you, was preserved. And Newsday, we asked, the, we asked people how the current administration was doing, and we allowed them to grade them. And it produced graphics. So it plugged into the back, and people were able to produce graphics and talk about it. And what was important for this is that it, both the Benjamin Franklin story and the idea of when you think of a community, when you think of a community, how it participates, you think holistically. Letting people just ride and yell at each other would not have been a good idea. In this current camp climate, there's a lot of that. And uh, uh, one of the things I say is I design for communities that I would kick myself out of. But how do you start to deal, to get people who see themselves as together in some way, but can't necessarily talk to participate. How do you ask? And we built that tool before we built talk, which was strange to some people. But there is this thing with communities where it's always, what do we tell, what do we sell, what do we tell? And not what do they need? Who are they? What do they feel? 
How do we get better? In journalism, you think that would be the first thing we do. We are not in a culture of that. So we built this. And I love everything. My team is fantastic. But this is, the fact that this came first has always made me really happy. Because this is how you show people you're interested. You ask questions. You connect to them. The other thing we built, which is now at the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, The Intercept, which said they would never have comments, but now they do, and IGN, Register, is how do we make it possible to have the conversations that best serve the purposes of the community? People feel however they feel about comments. A lot of people were like, you'll never ship anything. Comments are terrible. You don't need comments. And I'm like, you are completely correct. Comments are awful. People are often shocked when people go, so what do, you do when, what do you think we should do for our comments? How should our comments be? I'm like, you shouldn't have comments. You specifically should not have comments. <laughs> you don't have the bandwidth. You don't have the muscle. You, your arms are not long enough for that fight. But <laughs> you should have a way for people to give you feedback. How does your community tell you what they need? And even if you decide not to use our fantastic service, when you talk to us, what do you want? What, do you, what is your purpose? And in a lot of failures, people go, well, I'll build this tool. I'll build this new thing. And our tools are great. They're wonderful. Please go to our website. Look at them. What we find is not a failure of tools, but a failure of purpose. Not that they don't have purpose, but like, can you tell me? Does your community know? And with Coral, we were very specific about an interdisciplinary approach. So the next thing we built were guides. Strong community is about more than software. How do people know what to do when they get to a community space? When you look at a community space from software to design to journalism to theater to sports, I actually used a lot of theater of the oppressed from Auguste de Boal. So I kind of like circle back to myself. I was talking about news, newspaper theory and newspaper theater to fix news. Ah! Is do you know how to act? I use the fact that I'm from New York and I'm from Far Rock a lot because there is this deep, there is an unspoken thing of these are ultimately literary forms. We are dealing with forms that deal with the spoken word. We haven't expanded to different ways of communication, different levels of, it, of expression, different modes. And we like people who talk a certain way. We like people who display a certain amount of education, a certain kind of education. We, we prioritize English speakers. So when I ask these questions, I ask them, how would I ask people where I'm from? And what does it mean that you can or cannot understand that? And it is important because that is how your users are going to come into a space. If your users are hit by jargon, if they're hit by people who do not seem to have an onboarding process where you're looking around going, I just got here. I just wanted to know about this. And there's no space. Who lets them know what the space is? People talk often derisively about eternal September, where, oh, we were always onboarding newbies, and it's, there's, it's like September, and they're all moving in. And I'm like, it feels like eternal September because you don't have any way from, to move to October. It feels like eternal September because someone is always coming in, and you have no place for them to go. Here's where you learn, here's where you go, where you learn how to act. And then this is how you participate in the rest of it. And I think that that is super important. So the thing that was most important in the lesson that I thought was most useful is we are people. We design and build for people. If that is the one lesson I could take and give to everyone, that is the most important thing. That we have to people better. And we have to give space for people to people better. And what does that mean? Let me save you some time. We will all fail. There is no one who will hit a hundred, uh, bat a thousand. We will not be perfect at this. We will have spectacular failures. One of our first communities, I forgot one of the basic rules I tell everyone and left the comments on over the weekend and watched them implode. It was gifts happened, <laughs> lyrics happened. I just, I came back on Monday and was like, oh crap. <laughs> That's not the problem. It's setting places and processes for people to fail, and then moving forward based on a purpose is a question we have to answer. It's not a moment. We are often within, I shipped, it's done. I wrote, it's done. 
in the process of making community, of improvement, of iteration, of making every change, we're looking at process. We're looking at how do I handle this thing? How do I have space for this thing? How do I make some room for if something goes terribly wrong? Who has the stop button? Who has the start button? Who knows how this works? And can my community tell me that? So the question I often ask is not, how do we inclusive? It's like, what is your process? So, that's why I said this is an experiment and we are doing things very differently. You're gonna indulge me for a little bit. Do you mind indulging me? Okay, because this, I'm very big on permission and consent. And we're going to do this together. And we might share, because it's small enough that I'd actually like y'all to talk to each other. If you, might, if you want to, if you don't, you can stay and then we have question and answer. But we wanna ask, three questions. And I'm going to do it with you, and I'm also going to jump off the stage and walk around. But I'm going to give you time. And when I say I'm going to give you time, I mean I have a timer, and I am working it. And I want you to take three minutes per question. And I'm going to set it up and then say. But whatever your project, whatever you're thinking of, wherever you're thinking of making a community, I want you to think about these three questions. Who is we? Bam. Bam is capitalizing with F emphasis because I'm from New York City. And too often with communities, there's this idea of we're making a community and we. Who's the we? Do you mean the programmers? Do you mean the consumers? Do you mean your advertisers? Do you mean content contributors? Who's that we? And here's the thing. I believe you can, I might not like your answer, but you've got to have one. The thing that is most terrifying to me is not you have an answer that I don't like. We work across the political spectrum. We have. There are certain, there are certain people I don't talk to, but we work across the political spectrum. It is more frightening for me to for hear someone say, I don't know who I'm doing this for, than for them to say, I don't, say an answer I don't like. Because if you don't know, that means that someone is not being thought of, and someone is walking into a space that is not safe for them, and someone is walking into a space where you might not want them there, and they're going to feel that. And it is better for someone to know out the gate you don't want them in the space than for them to come and invest in a space and then feel unwanted. So that's question one. The next question, why is we here? And I phrase it that specifically both for the vernacular, but moment to moment, every single moment, you want someone to do something, you want your community to do something, you want people to be present. So at that moment, what do you want those people to do? Can you answer that question? Can they answer that question? Where would they go to find it? And three, what is we fixing to do? I talked in the beginning about imagination. And there are imagination realities. And what I think is often derided so much is that people make fun of dreamers. Dreamers are innovators. Dreamers are creators. Just because I dream don't mean I don't work. But if you want to make something that's never been made before, you have to be able to envision it. You have to be able to think about it. And too often in our workspaces, we go real, real fast. And we're not supposed to think. We're supposed to innovate and lean and agile and ah. And it's not a thing we do, and we have to do. And there's also the reality of the tabula rasa does not exist. There is no blank slate. We are formed the moment we are in society, and we are trying to make something happen. And we're fixing things with ourselves, but we're bringing our whole selves in, and we want to do a thing. Even if it's to sell ad dollars, we want to do a thing. So how do we do the thing? And write it down, even if it's notes for each questions. Imagine people overjoyed and pleased. Don't, you don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to share for sharing time. But I would like you to take a moment, whatever project's in your head, with these questions and do it. Think about not the project, but the people on the other end, the goals and the things that you are trying to accomplish. And it is 4.06. And I'm not going to do it so that we all have three minutes per question. I've realized that that's going to be shorter. 
I am going to say for five minutes, just five minutes, can you work on those three questions and I will do it as well with you. Sound like a good plan? Everybody feel okay? Anybody need writing material, water, anything? Okay, I'm on the timer. Go. Welcome, if you want, we're working on a five, three questions. Come on. Two minute, 30 second warning. And if you're sharing, that's cool. If you're not, that's cool, but we will have time to share, just to let you know. One minute.
Okay. So that was five minutes. <laughs> yeah, and I love that I can walk around with this mic. I hate standing behind podiums. But how did it feel to answer those questions? And we're a small enough group, I think you can like pop up. How did it feel to answer those questions? Have you ever had, everyone can hear me, right? Yep. Although they're recording it. Oh, that's important because transcripts are important. And <laughs> No, because accessibility is important. And that's another thing that we have to think about is that a lot of people go, well, yeah, I have theater training and I can be loud, but it's like, well, if we don't have the transcript, what about everybody else? Uh, but these are the questions in almost anything if you deal with, I, you deal with me is that I'll ask. It's like, so who is the we? And that is an important question to ask. And when we think of people, how did you decide your, who the we was? And I'm, now that remembering the recording, if anybody would like to tell, would you come up to the mic so people can hear? But how did you decide who the we was? I'm interested in processes. Uh, we, we found somebody who had an interesting project going on. And they talked oh. to us about what their project was. Cool. Come on, it's a conversation. So um, we're a client service agency, so mm -hmm. it was kind of weird because we're not them. They mm -hmm. hired us to help, and so we're kind of becoming part of that team, but mm -hmm. we're not like in that community. And the current client is trying to, you ask them who their we would be, and it would be residents of the region that they're providing news to, but the problems that we're finding are a lot within their own organization, and my thought in the last couple minutes was like, we is we need to fix you first before you can go out to the space or the region. But that is a really excellent thing to figure out and to do because what is off, because the interesting thing is the problems you have within your own group of people creating stuff are usually the problems you walk right out into the other groups and make. So if you can't communicate, you ain't gonna communicate well with other people. <laughs> and uh, does anybody else have a we that they're interested in talking about or wanna open up to the room? Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, I landed on the we that is the reason I am here, mm -hmm. which is I work for a college. Okay. Um, but even there, we are a lot of we's. We, we get siloed into staff, faculty, student. Um, we get siloed into I am in communications, which is different from admissions, which is different from this. Um, but it's more interesting to me to, to talk, to, to think about who are we, the college, who is our identity, who, 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 would, who am I allowed to be in a space with that I wouldn't be if I weren't at a college, and on top of that, a small college? We're only 2,000 people, right? Um, and so looking at, at you know, who, who we are as a community of learners, as a, a community that does service, and I, I position myself in that, but I don't know. Um, I, I decided to answer on behalf of the college, but I don't know that that was, if that was my week. And here's the thing, I like those answers because I think that there is, it was very important to me that we bring this that I did not have an answer. That we started and we are gonna to continue to do some more work with questions. I see a hand. I think if we're talking about communications and publishing and, you know, mm -hmm. and journalism, um, oftentimes the problems that we have to solve are these kind of internal the internal we, mm -hmm. but uh, we have to think about them in terms of what we're trying to do with the audience, the people that we're trying to reach. Um, because if we're too inward facing, if that if we is only inward facing, then then we just get caught up in the cycle of what the in, inner problems are rather than actually our whole purpose for being there. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and that's the second question. Why is we here? <laughs> Who has ever been to a meeting that could have been an email? 
you get somewhere around minute 15 and you're like, this could have been a bullet point. This could have been a bullet point. <laughs> and that is an important thing. The questions, as I have fine-tuned them and redone them, is they're not necessarily supposed to be answered in sequence. It's in total. So sometimes, why are we here, if I'm being proper, versus why is we here? But usually I'm like, why is we here? It because, helps us define the who we are. So it might be we just need the we of the folks who are doing X thing. And if we only need the we of the folks that are doing X thing, we need the, this is our way. And what are we trying to do? If we need the folks who are doing X thing, and the thing that we're trying to do is do X thing, we might be trying to do it better, we might be trying to do it faster, and that might inform who is or is not in the room. One of the big issues that I think comes up a lot in journalism and programming and whatever is that because we don't define these things, you get a lot of people who stand up and go, this is the we, and we are going to do the thing, and we're gonna, and who is we? Like I stand there and go, I actually speak French, so no one's telling me yes, I don't, uh, there's a lot of French going on, I did not sign up for this thing. So that is important to think about, and think about it in aggregate, because It's not necessarily bad to start small. It's not necessarily bad to be clear. What happens, and I think that this is what happens over and over again, is the disappointment. And this is what I think specifically that I've learned from community journalism when you ask people, is the disappointment people face when you tell them that you're there for them and you have no process to actually be there for them. You have no way of taking in their feedback, you have no way of adjusting yourselves for, this isn't safe for me, this doesn't work for me, so you're not there for them. And that is this very specific kind of resentment that you have to work through that is different than, hey, do you think you could do that thing that you do really well for those folks for us? The second one does always get you a lot more space than the, you promised me, you told me you were here for us, and then you weren't. We're going to do this exercise again, but, and this is from one of my favorite books by one of my favorite authors, and she has a new one out, but I like to recommend it to people, is Sarah Walker, Walker Bachter's Design for Real Life. And she talks about stress cages over edge cases, and what I would like to do with this collection of questions, and we'll get another five minutes going, is what would you do for that group, this group that you've imagined in your head, and we're gonna work it a little more. We have, ah, we're doing research well on time. Go me. Is, in notes, imagine this group is under stress. Something, the worst thing has happened, a terrible thing has happened for the group that you are thinking of. How, how does, this is so weird. How does that change these? Can you imagine them under stress? Can you imagine them under duress? And I'm gonna give you five minutes again, and then I'll share my own, is think about it and see how it affects, and I'll give you a half minute warning, and then the one minute warning. But how would that change if they were not an edge case, but a stress case. Because edge cases uh, imagine that no one will ever need this, but what happens is something terrible happens and everybody's stressed. Everybody needs some care or concern or guidance. How are we going to handle that? How does that change how we do this? And I'm keeping time. I'm on my Mr. Rogers. Go. And if you had a group, reconvene. <laughs>
two minute warning. Thirty seconds. Okay. Okay, we get it, Apple. So, how did that change the exercise? How did that feel for folks? With and if, remember, as we are recording, people have to go to the mic. But did anything change substantially for anyone? trying to do, uh, I had to drop out the creativity part, hmm. you know, a little bit. Um, uh, so I work with a content delivery team. We are providing the tools that creators and editors use um, to produce news content. And um, in a stress case, all sense of, you know, this would be really cool and let's be super creative about this kind of goes out the window in favor of speed and time to market. Anybody else? I got to thinking of identifying a point person. So one person who the community can go to Preferably somebody who is calm and can listen and take in feedback, but not necessarily respond or do something, but somebody who could be that person who helps calm the people in the stressful situation. Over here so I don't talk you. <laughs> so mine isn't journalism related, it's local government related. I work for a local government, and we have a number of local governments that in our region who are now all using Drupal. And those of us who all use Drupal, nobody talks to each other. And the people who live in our jurisdiction, in our region, when they need help or services or information, they often don't know which, you know, which agency provides it, which government, they don't care if it's the county or the city, they need to know when their garbage is getting picked up or if it's the regional government. So my we is a group who, you know, meets up of all of those people who touch Drupal for the different local governments. And in the situation of a stress situation, you know, now that people all know, hopefully have all known each other because they've connected through this one becoming a we, 
We spend a lot of times either having an emergency, we have to spin up a website because there's this new collaboration between the city and the county and nobody knows who to do it or where to do it, so somebody goes off and gets a Squarespace site. And, or there's now been a dissolution of this partnership and somebody has to own the website going forward. And nobody knows each other, so these things just kind of float around and they get kicked back and forth and it wastes a lot of time. So hopefully after this we has been established, this we can then be more efficient when situations like this arise. Anyone else? And I share my mic. If you haven't guessed, I don't necessarily like the standing on the podium thing. So I'm also in higher ed, and my we was my marketing and communications team. And we are always under stress. Um, <laughs> from, from the other we's around us, there's a lot of silos, I think uh, someone here had mentioned before, uh, and breaking those down. But something I just heard in a leadership seminar last week was about the owning who you are first before trying to bridge gaps with others. So we, we have a hard time saying no. We don't feel empowered to say no to anyone. Uh, we, we not, we're not a chargeback scenario. So we have to do stuff and we can't just say, we'll bill you more. No, they just keep coming. So what I would like to do, and I think it's gonna get a little more stress, but then hopefully get more comfortable would be to own who we are, own our expertise more, identify who we are and say, listen, we're the communications professionals. We want to help you, but let us help you with our expertise, so. I think one of the important things about this is sometimes no is the best answer. That one of the things that's like, one of the reasons that I talked about ask, and just so you know, it is very important for me to say this, Coral is compatible with Drupal. Ask and talk are compatible with Drupal, if you're wondering. I have cards. <laughs> is some, when you do specifically for these group of three exercises that I think about and do, is it's okay if your answer isn't software. It's okay if your answer isn't the same software for the same thing. So you might have a situation where you have one piece of software for we have time, we are easy, we are breezy, we are cover girl, and we can do whatever we want. And then you might have something that's just like, nope. This just has to get out. That has to be a different thing. And you might have that, the, your question was a process question. This might need to be a better process. Now there are tools we can build, there are things we can do, and that was part of what we did with Ask and Tell, where we put parts of those process into the software. But that is a thing where you start thinking about, how do we do this thing? And that is what Coral was. And those are, that is one of the biggest lessons I learned from journalism, is that to actually design for people, we have to remember people. And so often, so, so often, it becomes just the task. It just becomes just the thing. But that task and that thing is going to be done by a person. And in the spirit of sharing, I am going to tell you a little bit about the thing that I'm doing now, in addition to Coral, is I don't want to get back on the stage. I just want to hit the space bar. <laughs> so now I am editor for Mozilla Foundation. And one of the things that we are thinking about, and this is part of the reason I wanted to come in addition to telling you how wonderful Coral is, is we work right now are trying to work around the language of internet health. So how do you help people think of a healthy internet? How do you help people talk about an, a healthy internet? And also, how do you help people become involved and speak a language? And when people ask me, what is my we? My we is people who, need the, people who use the internet and don't understand why they have to. And don't understand how they're doing it. Because it's very easy to get in a room with people who know exactly what's up. And you talk to everyone. And they talk about Bitcoin and blockchain. And I understand those intellectually. And then I roll my eyes and go, can anyone say that in a paragraph under 170 words? Anybody? My kingdom, I got $50. No, I seriously, to this day, I laid out a bet that I will give 50 bucks to the person who can explain electronic currency, Bitcoin at all, to me in under 170 words. No word can have more than two syllables. I still have my 50 bucks. How much is that Bitcoin? <laughs> but I'm cheek. 
And also, how do we look at, we started with Benedict Anderson and the imagined communities. So how do we look at a community and make them feel included? Not just in the, I want to include everybody, so I'm going to say it a lot. But how do you make design and the words and the work include people? And I get to look at fun stuff, but it also makes me look further afield. I'm looking right now at churches. I've never known so much about painted doors in Dublin in my life. Did you know that in the Gregorian England, English time period, people in Dublin painted their doors to indicate that they were resisting or non-resisting? People, the way we set up churches, the way we put up iconography, if you look up, a lot of those symbols tell people what happens here. 